Welcome to the Kennedy Report. I'm Kennedy Hall. What really happened at Assisi with Pope John Paul II? Did he authorize demon worship? Was it pagan worship? Was it an act of apostasy? Are the traditional Catholics just freaking out over nothing? Was it totally fine? We're going to talk about that. But first, we got to thank our sponsors over at Noble Gold. Now is the time to set goals for the next cycle of inflation. If you've heard of Justin Trudeau and you've heard of Joe Biden, you know that there's going to be more financial difficulties because those men are absolute morons. This way, you're always moving forward. You're growing. You're making money. You're not losing it. Imagine. Have more freedom financially and you can have more fun. Start a gold IRA with Noble Gold now and fight inflation. And this month for every IRA above $20,000, you'll get an incredible three ounce silver American virtue coin completely free as a thank you you can't go wrong with noble gold call 1-877-646-5347 that's 1-877-646-5347 call this number now to find out more or visit noblegoldinvestments.com thank you to our friends at noble gold you don't have to be a financial expert to know that as the markets go up and down and up and down having something that's had a historical value gives you peace of mind thank you noble gold okay what happened at Assisi? Well, Cole's notes, Assisi was a gathering, a prayer gathering that was ordered by John Paul II when he was Pope in the 1980s. Um, and it was the world's leaders of world religions were to come and do this sort of you know, amorphous prayer for peace. Um, and uh, some people have heralded it, uh, heralded it as a amazing event in the church. And others have said that it was a great stain on the church. And we're going to talk about that and how we should see it from a Catholic perspective. But to do that, we should probably watch a quick video here of what actually happened. And here's a clip of what happened at Assisi. Take a look. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, so, what do you think? Did that look like Catholicism? It didn't really to me. So the first thing I want to do is I want to give the way that this has been seen by the liberals in the church, and then I'll give you the way that it's been seen by well-meaning conservatives in the church. So, of course, the way it's been seen by the liberals in the church is essentially that this was a great victory for liberalism. This was a great victory for, you know, the oneness of all religions. And John Paul II finally moved past those, you know, uh, medieval superstitions that the Catholic Church was the only church and, and uh, the spirit of the Second Vatican Council really took hold and the world and the church could finally unite and kumbaya and blah, 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 blah. I can tell you from experience that when I was a Catholic educator for about seven years or so, 
Uh, you will find posters of this event in basically every religion classroom you ever go to, and it is always used as justification by the liberal religion teachers that the Pope okayed pagan worship, therefore being a pagan is fine. The Pope okayed non-Catholic worship, therefore non-Catholic worship is fine. The Pope did not have a problem with Islam or Buddhism or whatever, therefore they're fine. That's what people believe. That's what they believe. The fallout of this is even worse than that. Because not only does it affect this idea whether or not people need to become members of the church, which Christ said, outside of which there is no salvation. Um, it also comes to the point where, okay, well, if the Pope is okay with these non-Catholic religions, he's also okay with like Islam, for example, which they believe in God and they believe Jesus is a prophet, but not God. So if you're a Catholic, you don't really have to believe Jesus was God because, you know, why would you? I mean, the Pope's okay with people that don't believe Jesus is God, but they just think he's special. So thumbs up for Jesus, but yeah, if he's not God, no big deal. That's what the effect of this thing has been. How many numerous, how many souls have been damned? We know the normal means of salvation. Salvation is kind of a mystery, of course, but we know the normal means. Dying as a member of the church in a state of grace. It's basic, Catechism 101. How many souls left the church? I don't know. Then there is the conservative Catholic position. And I've heard this story from John Paul II apologists, where essentially what happened was, is John Paul II was basically performing some sort of political posturing. And he was fighting against the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union being communist was completely materialist. Therefore, they wanted to suppress religion in general, especially the church, but, but religion in general, because religion gets in the way of your, of your belief as the state as being supreme, basically. So what John Paul II did is he said, I'm not only the leader of the church, but I'm going to one-up you. And I'm going to be in I'm going to show you that I have influence over all the religions in the world because I'm going to invite them all to come to me. They're all going to come to me and your Soviet Union be damned and we're all going to pray for peace and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, apparently this was received as a very terrifying event by the Soviet Union. That's what I've been told. I have no way to verify this. I'm just saying this is the the interpretation from well-meaning conservative Catholics who I want to give the benefit of the doubt that this was not something more, you know, to me it looks something like the abomination of desolation that we find in Book of Maccabees, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but they're trying to give it a positive spin. And an example of this is an article from Catholic Answers. Catholic Answers is great, um, but this just kind of shows the extent that people will go to to kind of explain away uh, just how bad what happened actually was. And this is an article entitled, Did Pope John Paul II Authorize Buddhist Worship? I don't know when it's from. It doesn't have a date on it that I can find. Um, in any case, the question, is it true that Pope John Paul II authorized a statue of Buddha to be placed on an altar in Assisi and incensed? Because that actually happened. Outside of what we saw in video, there was a church um, in Assisi where a Buddhist priest or whatever they call them, put a Buddha on an altar and they did their Buddhist incantations around the tabernacle. Answer, Pope St. John Paul II did not place a statue of Buddha on the altar of a Catholic church in Assisi in 1986. There's a problem there. The question was not, did John Paul II place the Buddha? The question was whether it was authorized. And he did not so, do so in any of the subsequent interfaith Assisi gatherings. Oh yeah, there was more than one of those. So the one wasn't enough, but there were more. Neither did any other Catholic official. Rather, the placement was done by once by Buddhists in 1986 who did not realize the inappropriateness of the gesture. Blah, blah, blah. He goes on to uh, show a quote here from a Vatican journalist named Sandro Magister. And it says, The event in Assisi added fuel to the fire through some of its more excessive gestures. Some of the city's churches were allotted for the prayers of Buddhists. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. He said in the article... Um, Catholic officials, neither did any Catholic official authorize what had happened with the Buddha in a church. But hold on a second here. The journalist reporting about what happened at the time said that some of the city's churches were allotted for the prayers of the Buddhists, Hindus, and African animists. Those are devil worshippers. That's what the Bible tells us. And it says, as if these buildings were neutral containers void of any indelible Christian value. The Buddhists set up a shrine of Buddha on the altar of the local church of St. Peter. So the church named after the Pope. Um, anyway, 
the author says, Magister's article possesses some critical commentary of the event, to say the least. But what is most relevant and helpful for this discussion is his setting the record straight. Setting the record straight that the Buddhists placed the statue on their own and that it was not done by the Pope or the church or church officials, nor with the Pope's approval or that of other of church officials. Finally, as noted, the placement of the statue has not been repeated in subsequent interfaith gatherings that the popes have initiated at Assisi. Okay, so we set the record straight. Phew! We, we dodged a bullet there. The Pope didn't place the Buddhist statue on there. It was just his officials in the event that he called that said the Buddhists could use the churches for Buddhist prayers. Oh, that's totally different, right, guys? You know... People think that the Pachamama event was bad. The Pachamama event only took place once. And in fairness to Pope Francis, as bad as it was, he was sitting outside watching it, not in a church, but in the gardens. There was the bringing up of that idol in the, in the mass, and that's terrible. Um, but I would argue that what happened at Assisi was worse than what happened with Pachamama. Because the Pope actively participated in an event with all of the leader of the world's false religions. Um, there was her there was error and false religion at Pachamama, but it was it was one religion. It wasn't even really an official religion. It was kind of random mixing of various paganisms. As a CC, it was very intentional. It was like invite so and 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 so to represent such and such and such and such and such and such a religion and have them give them places to go do their worship. That's pretty bad. I mean, it's at least as bad as Pachamama. I personally think it's worse. So, how should Catholics respond to this? Well, in the book of Maccabees, we find something similar. And um, if you don't know anything about the Book of Mac Maccabees, Cole's notes, the Holy Land was conquered by the Greeks. And the Greeks brought with them their pagan religions, so on and so forth, and lots of suppression of religion and whatever. But things came to a head when uh, the Greeks influenced the religious leaders of the Jews. And it says in Maccabees, I'm paraphrasing, but that some of the Jewish leaders, the priests, the whatever, the, the, the religious leaders, they actually started to participate in the pagan sacrifices. Um, they started doing things like eating pork and offering incense and whatever. Um, and then it got to the point where the altar itself was profaned. And this sparked an armed rebellion. Now, context, armed rebellion was appropriate at Maccabees because there was an armed conquest. Okay, so it was a response of in kind, I'm not advocating for the same response as Maccabees, but it's the spirit of the thing that we're looking to here. And if we look to First Maccabees chapter four, verse thirty-eight, we find this is how the Maccabees under Judah Maccabee or Judas, depending how you pronounce it, what translation, how they responded, and it says, "And they saw the sanctuary desolate, and the altar profaned, and the gates burnt." and shrubs growing up in the courts as in a forest or on the mountains, and the chambers joining to the temple thrown down. And they rent their garments and made great lamentation and put ashes on their heads, and they fell down to the ground on their faces, and they sounded the great trumpets of alarm, and they cried towards heaven. Then Judah appointed men to fight against them that were in the castle till he had cleansed the holy places, and he chose priests without blemish, who will set who whose will was set upon the law of God. And they cleansed the holy places and took away the stones that had been defiled into an unclean place. And he considered about the altar of holocausts that had been profaned, what he should do with it. And a good counsel came into their minds to pull it down, lest it should be a reproach to them because the Gentiles had defiled it. So they threw it down. And it says they took whole stones according to the law and built a new altar according to the former. So things to take away from here. They saw the sanctuary desolate and the altar profaned. When you put pagan idols on an altar, you profane the altar. 
And this was so grave that they rent their garments and they did public penance for the act. And then what did Judah do? He didn't say, well, you know, every priest is a priest and no big deal. They're all valid priests. It says he chose priests without blemish. He chose holy priests and whose will was set upon the laws of God. And they cleansed the holy places and took away the stones that had been defiled into an unclean place. So they literally went in and they took away the altar that had been desecrated and made a new one because it was such a grave crime what had happened. Now, is there a one-to-one -one correlation what had happened at Assisi and what happened in Maccabees? Of course, it's not the exact same. They weren't doing like sacrifices of animals to Jupiter or something like that. But it's more like that than not. If we're looking in the library in the section of apostasy in the Catholic Church of pagan worship mixed with the true religion, we're going to have to go to the same section of the library to find what happened at Assisi. And we're also going to find sort of like what happened at Maccabees. It's not going to be in the section of saintly actions by popes. It's going to be in the section of grave crimes against the church. You know, I've got friends who are traditionally minded Catholics, but, and I'm not here to beat up on John Paul II. I'm just saying, you know, this is a real problem. And I've got friends who try to say, well, you know, John Paul II was still really great, but what happened at Assisi was a disaster. Finding out that a pope has a mistress is a disaster. Finding out that a priest has embezzled funds, that's a disaster. Finding out that they're going to put a table altar in your church, but at least still offer a Catholic mass, that's a, that's a disaster. Giving the church to pagan idol worshippers is not just a disaster. Leading a, a, a standing shoulder to shoulder as if there's an equality of devil religions, of, of false religions and the true religion, that's not just a disaster. That's the kind of thing that you read about in the Old Testament and you find that God opened the ground to swallow the people up who were a part of it. That is an existential crime. It is not just a disaster. I wish it was just a, just a disaster. It's an existential crime against the church and against Christ. You see, there was a man of our time who reacted like a Judah Maccabee. He saw what had happened and he decided that it was necessary to go and train some men to create priests without blemish to come and cleanse the holy places and restore the faith. And his name was Marcel Lefebvre. And how was that man treated? Well, John Paul II declared that he had excommunicated himself for his efforts to make priests without blemish so they could cleanse the holy places. I should tell you something. So what really happened at Assisi? Well, it was much closer to devil worship than anything. And when we have popes even in the same neighborhood as devil worship, we should be alarmed. Let me know what you think in the comments. I think that's enough for today. So please like this video, subscribe to this channel. See how you can help us uh, continue to grow. Thank you for all your support. You can find that information in the description. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.